Hello. I'm Shirley Romaine, and this is Art Scene on Long Island, a program in which each week we bring you the artists, performing arts groups, and institutions that enrich the quality of our lives here on Long Island. My guests today uh, are Dedrick Johnson and Lloyd Means, who together have created a remarkable film uh, about a Long Island community, its history, and its struggle for equality uh, politically, economically, and educationally. It's really quite a film. It's Spinney Hill, The African American History of Manhasset and Great Nick. And it uh, includes, it's a film that includes interviews with key people in that community. Uh, Lloyd uh, is, the, uh, is the editor and the technical director. Dedrick is the writer, and he lives in Spinney Hill. And Lloyd grew up in Great Neck, so we have two <laughs> authentic people who made this film. Absolutely. Uh, I'm really delighted to have you both here. Thank I'm you. So, Thank you. It's so great that you could make the time to Our come. Our pleasure. Yeah. Anyway, the film is really terrific. I'm, I'm honored to be able to do this. But I did Google you. I didn't have a lot of information. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe I'll get some extra stuff if I Google them. <laughs> but it, it says something very interesting. So let me just share it with oh. you. You probably wrote it. <laughs> but let me just share it with our, with our viewers. Um, the African American history, Spinney Hill, The African American History of Manhasset and Great Neck, is a vast and dynamic history uh, here, put, here put together in over 20 interviews. Uh, and it's the story of one of Long Island's best kept secrets. Let's see, so we're going to have to. <laughs> find out about that. And uh, the Spinney Hill story told by those who witnessed and influenced some of the remarkable milestones and challenging losses. So I think that that really says it very well. Whoever mm -hmm. said it, said it very well. Yeah. You, okay, <laughs> you're the writer, yeah. so it's, it's great. Uh, well, I really want to know what the secret is, but maybe we'll find that out as we go along. Sure. Unless yeah. you want to, well, like, we should have some suspense. Well, so, you know, to start, Lloyd came to me with this idea. Well, to, that's my next question, is where did the idea for this come from? Yeah, so. uh, to do this documentary <coughs> about uh, the history of Spinney Hill, um, the borderline between Manhattan and Great Neck, yeah. um, F. Scott Fitzgerald's East and West Eggs, as it were, yes, in his yes. classic novel, The Great yeah. Gatsby, yeah. Uh, this modest African-American community uh, situated, surrounded by some of uh, New York's most affluent families. Absolutely. Yeah, so when he came to me, I was elated. I grew up on Spinney Hill. Yeah. And uh, during that time, it was, um, there were black owned businesses from Lakeville Road traveling east to East Shore Road, the, the intersection at East Shore Road and Community Drive. Yeah. And then all along uh, East Shore Road, there were black owned businesses. There were uh, nightclubs, dry cleaners, beauty salons, barbershops all types of eateries. Yeah. There was even a black owned hotel. Yeah. And uh, not only were they the big business occupants, uh, but they were the sole proprietors of their, you know, they owned the buildings yeah. that they were in, many of these families. Yeah. And it was a totally different place from what it is now. Yeah. And it was very alive. So yeah. when he came to me, I was, I was ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was essentially your idea about well, doing it. <clears throat> one of the gentlemen saw the 100 years of Manasset and felt that we wasn't fairly, we had a small, it looked like we had a small part in the community. And so I put to Dedrick, Dedrick with the work researching, finding out information, yeah. and then we started the interviewing. Yeah, oh, that's so interesting. Uh, but that was my first question, really, what got you going? Mm -hmm. And I guess it was, you know, just really reading about it and, yeah. and, and you know, saying, one. let's make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> Judy and Mickey, <laughs> let's make a movie. Uh, the other thing, uh, uh, did, did you sort of begin with a picture of what you wanted, or did it sort of evolve as you went along? It did evolve. We kind of set out uh, to to uh, approach certain issues, uh, such as uh, the integration of schools and you know urban renewal. And uh, we had an idea of what we were looking for, but it did evolve because people like Grace Walker uh, was very, uh, uh, you know, she helped out a lot because she offered us new angles and new different ideas because uh, of her of her history, her personal history. Yeah. You know, she dates back. She was talking about things that happened during the turn of the century with, with her mom and so forth. Yeah. So that really opened up new doors for yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, it's interesting. I, well, you brought some clips from the film, yes. and I'm so glad you did. And they sort of tell us <laughs> some of the questions I want to ask you. Right. So why don't we look at the first clip? And, you know, can you set it up for us? Tell us what well, we're going to see. Well, I believe the see. first, uh, I think it opens of jobs, and you will have uh, Grace Walker, like I said, talking about, you know, when her family uh, was here, maybe in the early 20s, yeah. and the work that they had available. So, yeah. you know, a lot of people were coming from the South that, that during that time, yeah. trying to get away from the laborious work of the fills, and here they had a, you know, they had the idea that they could, you know, fare better here in Long yeah. Island. So. Probably somebody was here, you know, like maybe a few families came with, with the families who hired them. And I guess word got back because sure. it's kind of an interesting, you yeah. know, it isn't Pittsburgh, it isn't Detroit, it isn't Chicago. It's, you know, where a lot yeah. of people from the South came. Most of those people came from uh, Atkins, South Carolina. Uh, so it was, you, you yeah, know. It was like the word. Uh, exactly. Come, they got the word and everybody working. came up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at this first clip. Okay. In 1920, that was the time of the, um, the Gold Coast era. That's when the wealthy people were coming here and um, building these large mansions. It wasn't that much job in the, in the South other than picking cotton, or picking tobacco, or, you know, hard labor. So they come up, especially when the the people started to hire, uh, the rich people in Great Lake started to hire uh, women to come and work in their houses, you know, day workers and weekend work, week workers. You know, that went on for many years, you know, up until the, maybe into the 1970s, there was a strong influx of girls coming from uh, all parts of the South to work on the sleeping jobs. My uncle was a, a chauffeur at that time. That was considered a real plush job. And uh, the women did housework. I mean, you, you had 80% probably of domestic workers. When my parents came, the, the, domestic, that's where they came. They, I mean, you know, they came looking for more money. And, where, and if they didn't have the skills, if they didn't, if, if like my moms who finished sixth grade or somebody, what, what else are they gonna do but, but uh, domestic work? And so you had a major, you had some exceptions of people, like the Powells maybe who came, who bought, who were fortunate to buy a cabs. And, but there was very, very, those were the exceptions. But, but I, would, I would venture to say that most of, w with the exception of, of a few who worked for the town, like the Swingins and some of the other people who worked for the town, is that s at least 70% of the people probably worked in, in domestics. And that's why we felt we needed job opportunities, we needed job training. There were some people in the community, like Mel Greenberg was one, I don't know if you know about him. And he had a factory, and he took people and trained them. Um, interesting, yes. you know, about how they got here. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, uh, a good deal of research, you touched on the research. Uh, I, how did you go about it? Where did you go? Where did you find these people? All grassroots. Well, with the, with the interviewees, um, we pretty much knew some of the major players that you know oh, because you we you know growing up you knew who was involved in what so that kind of helped but as we did the interviews uh we became we, we referred to grace walker and some others and uh they really contributed majorly to the yeah. to the project yeah. yeah and we're all very willing i'm sure to share absolutely they had to share. very informative but people. then you went to school in manhasset yes and then manhasset high school yes yeah. And then did you go, you went to Great Neck School? Oh, actually, I actually went to Manhattan with Tedrick. <clears throat> we went to high school together. I didn't, I mean, I live in Great Neck just by location. <laughs> I see. Oh, but you were in the I'm in Manhattan, Manhattan School District. Manhattan so, yeah. as well. Oh, so you knew people who had taught and you knew Absolutely, some of yeah. people, people. However, Olga Jenkins, who we're going to see in one of these talks, well, she was in Great Neck. Uh, yes, she was. But fact, she was a really powerful woman. Oh. <laughs> so I get you yeah, mean, she had a lot to do with with many different, uh, you know, as not only was she a teacher in the school, but yeah. she was very active in the community. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, you both have day jobs. So, <laughs> so <laughs> how long Thank did God. it take you to shoot this film? Uh, two years to. Yeah, about two years. Two years. Editing about took, two years. Edi yeah. yeah, questions, two yeah. years, and the editing yeah. took a long yeah. time. And you knew some of the history. I mean, you knew it, you know. You Dedrick knew. I was more like, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, we have another clip. Yeah. You mm -hmm. brought us a wealth of riches here, so yes. let's have a look at them. I what that, are we going to see? I What's believe this one, one is uh, the integration of schools. And uh, I think it opens with uh, Grace Walker again. She's talking about how her mother had gone to a, a, a desegregated school and um, how it had changed over the time and uh, as more people came in uh, the, the uh, government had changed and schools had changed and then the schools became segregated and by 1954 or so forth Ruth Robinson will come in and she'll explain to you um, how it was when she came yeah. from South Carolina. Yeah. Okay, let's see the next clip. But I'd like to show you the pictures when my mother went to school. Lakeville School was, there were as many black as there were white as people after the 1900s. I, I, I feel that it got to be more prejudiced than it was when everybody was poor, everybody was farmers, and uh, the government wasn't as strong as it, as it uh, became. The greatest shock to me when I moved to Manhasset was that here I was in Manhasset, New York, coming from South Carolina, which was a seg you know had segregated schools, but coming to Manhasset, a rich, supposedly be a rich area to find that there was a segregated school in Manhasset. There was the Valley School, which was what you now know as EOC, and that's where the kids went from K through six. And the teachers were very lackadaisical, and by the time they came to the junior high, which is where they were integrated, they were behind and they were uncomfortable. The Manhattan Valley School, which is not the ELC, uh, just, uh, the community center. Yeah, you can still see the uh, uh, school sign, Manhattan Valley. You can barely see it. And of course, the, uh, uh, the cornerstone says 1929. Now, education, that's all so interesting. You know, we don't know this. I mean, I live right next door. I live in Great Neck, and I don't know this. And I go through Spinney Hill. I can't tell you how many times up and down the sure. hill. And of course, we want to talk about how it looks now, which is really mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, what I wanted to ask was, uh, education, though, was really key to the struggle, wasn't it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the integration of schools was very important. Uh, again, as Dr. Jenkins says, you know, the uh, the education they were getting, or I think Ruth Robinson touched on it in her interview, she was saying that the education that they were getting, they were behind the other schools yeah. in years. And it, and it made a tremendous difference, and that shows because uh, the child that was, uh, that the, that the uh, Brown, uh, the Board of Education versus... Uh, Brown the, versus Board of Education. Well, there was a local case with Blocker versus the Board of Education, and that the guy who was trying to integrate with the schools, his name was Ralph Blocker. And uh, his class, his senior year class, each of those kids, it was 12 of them, black kids, and they all went to colleges. And they, they did very well for themselves. So it just shows you, uh, that just tells you how important yeah, it was how, for them to be integrated into yeah, the main yeah. system. Did you both go on to on college? I assume that you did. Where yeah, did, I did you go? Yeah, I went to Syracuse, in the corner of Syracuse. To Syracuse. Syracuse. Yeah, oh, Syracuse so did my husband. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an orange man. <laughs> yes, you're an orange man. <laughs> I, I know it's a very good school. Uh, yes. But you're you're really a very accomplished technical director. You work for Cablevision. Yeah. For our own Cablevision. Yeah. I don't do this kind of work, but um, I pretty much Google and YouTube. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
<laughs> but you're a real troubleshooter. Uh, yeah, really absolutely. He's being modest. He's no, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That's really great. You don't have to be an atomic scientist <laughs> or a nuclear or whatever. You can be a troubleshooter. Yeah. And it's really very good. And how about you? I didn't, I didn't attend a university. After, after high school, I went straight to work. Uh -huh. yeah, it was different times then. Yeah, yeah. but you, now you, you work. You, you work at, yeah. at you, North Shore Hospital. At Shore. North Shore Hospital, yeah. which is easy. Yeah, it's just I mean, you just roll out of bed, and <laughs> there you are. Oh. He doesn't know about rush hour. <laughs> <laughs> that's really nice. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, just one question. You were talking about the community and the, sh and the businesses and the shops that were there. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to picture in my own mind, were they along Northern Boulevard? Were they along... They weren't on Community Drive, because that's were always been residential. Along Northern right? Boulevard from Lakeville Road to going traveling east... Uh, to the intersection of East Shore Road and Community, Community Drive, Drive, and then all, all along East Shore Road, there were black-owned businesses on both sides of the I street. See. It's like that mile stretch. I yeah. see. And yeah. of course, now there's there's really nothing. There's the playground and the swimming pool and all of that. Yeah. Were those businesses, or were they on the other side? Well, Whitney Pond Park, are yeah, you referring Whitney to? Yeah, Whitney Pond. Uh, yeah, that's that's been there for. Uh, at least 1970. Yeah. So it's been there quite a while, and they yeah. made they built the additional pool, uh, the diving tank, and so forth. Yeah. And when I was a child, and yeah. uh, but that park has always been there. And, yeah. and Grace Walker talks about skating on the yeah. ice over there throughout yeah. the winters. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's always been available. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's wonderful. I love to watch to go by, and I love to see the guys yeah. playing basketball. Sure. Because it's for real. Did it's you play? It's a beautiful play? park. Did I play basketball? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Yeah, well, you're very tall. So, anyway, <laughs> think about it. Yeah. No, it's really great, and it mm -hmm. gets a lot of use. I mean, it gets dark. You know, they do it in the yeah. night, which that, is really... That place stayed busy, yeah. like, every night. Yeah. You would have to just wait for so long just yeah. to get on the court yeah. because there were so many people yeah. out there. You know, isn't it interesting that you have that phenomenon at the tennis courts in Great Nick, mm -hmm. and you have it at the basketball court sure. in Manhasset, which is so telling. You know, yeah. that, that's, that's it. That's the culture. That's it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was uh, interesting to me how sports and the arts played a role in uh, in your community, mm -hmm. and that and that com sense of community is really uh, throughout the film. It's so strong. Absolutely, it's a presence yeah. and it's absence, and you know all of that is mm -hmm. really great. Um, but t t tell us about a little bit about the the uh, sports and the arts, and then we're going to see another clip. Well, I mean, sports and uh, and the arts, yeah, rather the drama. Uh, that was uh, the center, the, the, center. the community center yeah. That, yeah. that really led the way with all yeah. that. Yeah. You know, we grew up with uh, the at the community center. They had music programs, so we, we'll, I guess we'll talk about that uh, next uh, clip. in the next clip. But yeah, uh, well, let's go to the next clip because yeah. it's about that. Let's go to the next one. Mm -hmm. The community center that has its genesis on, 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 uh, on Pond Hill Road had, has a history. It was a community center, and we had people who started that center, uh, Mrs. Treadwell and a Mrs. Uh, Brazley, who started the center. The, uh, there was no EOC at that time, but this is the forerunner of the EOC. The EOC only is an outgrowth of the anti-poverty it, it, it was the, the, the poverty when, when, when Johnson signed the bill, if you, if, you, if you recall, I forgot what it, but that's, and they received monies to be able to stimulate communities. That's how the EOC uh, was birthed. Oh, the earlier years of the Manhattan Community Service Center were great years, great years. Um, there were a lot of activities, as I stated before, at the Manhattan Community Service Center. Now, when I talk about activities there, I'm talking about activities from the science club to basketball. We had sewing. Mrs. Batillo um, uh, was in charge of sewing. And then you had the music, Mr. Maynard, and then Mr. Um, Conway was in charge of the gym and the activities in the gym. They had a jukebox room. Some years later, even downstairs, they had a woman come in and redecorate which they made into the coffee house. Um, 
There were sponsored trips out of the community to see shows on Broadway, to go to certain events. Even the basketball team had a, a league in which they uh, played against other centers in the Long Island area. So there was always, and then Mrs. Brazley, she had African dance, she would always, there was always activities going on um, during the week. And um, in the summertime, my first job was um, given to me uh, through the Manhattan Great Nick EOC through their summer program. Uh, that sense of community, it was so strong. I mean, really, uh, it's one of the most, it's the major thing that came out at me after seeing it. Um, it was, uh, you know, and it really was able, you were able to advance those needs and so on. Is it still there? Is it still that way, the community? This, absolutely. We commemorate the, uh, that legacy of closeness and togetherness every, every uh, first and, Sunday after the, the first Sunday after the 4th of July, the whole community gets back together uh -huh. um, people, from all over the country. People fly in from everywhere. And, really? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. It's, and do they have classes? Do they do things like teach the things? Well, the EOC have? right now don't have the funding. They're they desperately in need of funding right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of programs, they're pretty much bare bone programs right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, you talked about the businesses that used to be there. Yes. And, you know, that really gave it another kind of community shape. It was like you could go to those shops and yeah. do what you had to do, shop and groceries, I'm sure, and yeah. everything. I remember as a, as a small boy, I'd go into the barber shop and my barber, Ray, would stand up over his chair with his big cigar clenched in between his teeth yeah. and sharpening his razor against those leather straps. <laughs> and he'd have his friends sitting along the wall yeah. and yeah. they're re reading their newspaper and listening to yeah. the ball game, yeah. probably discussing okay. Willie Mays or something. Perfect, <laughs> yeah. perfect. Yeah. Uh, but what happened to it? Well, uh, there was a project that was called Urban Renewal, yeah. and I think that was headed by the town. And I, I can't be, I don't want to be not, I don't want to not be accurate in saying what I, but. Um, and what do you uh, think? They were m displaced. They were asked to move out and then move into the trailers until the redevelopment of that car to uh, happen and uh, they moved out, the buildings were torn down and they never moved back. And in the next clip I think they'll, they'll talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a look at the next clip. Now when I went to Manhasset there was a black barber shop, a black beauty parlor, a black hotel, a black bar. They were all located on Northern Boulevard, uh, up from East Shore Road. So Hector was in charge of urban renewal. Hector told the people that if they would move out, the business people, that if they would move out, everything would be redone beautifully and they would come back to a wonderful situation. Well, I, I remember that the business people who owned the restaurants and the taxis and everything, they were promised that if they moved across the street, they would come back when everything was complete. And that was called urban renewal. I don't think there was a plan to, to put back black-owned businesses once they, once they got tore down because I think these people came and offered so much money uh, that a black person at that time didn't have a, uh, a, a chance to, to open up another business. If I could remember correctly, because these guys, they, that was already prime real estate and they, want, they already wanted it. You know, they, they wanted that, that hill for a long time. Well, of course, when it was developed, it was too expensive. There was no way that any black people could move into those. They became doctor's offices and business offices and things of that sort. So um, some of us felt that Hector had really sold out, had misrepresented the situation because um, if it was going to become a white um, area, there should have been some little portion left for the black businessmen. They would just forget it. They were gone. Well, that's really, that's really what happened, and that's t terrible. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. just terrible. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, oh, listen, the secret. You know, we talked about the secret. Yeah. Is there another secret? Well, the we secret is, is that no one, you know, people who have come to Manhasset within the last 20, 30 years have no idea that Spinney Hill had ever existed in such a way. Yeah. So uh, that is the secret. That is. Okay, the yeah. secret is, is just knowing this yeah. history. Exactly. I mean, the demographic is changing, and the fact that as a minority we had an impact yeah. in the community. Yeah. So it was yeah. Let me, I want to put the information up on the screen. I think this is a film that really must be seen, mm. not just locally, because I think what it says is about our country. You yeah. know, it's not just Great Neck and Manhasset. It's a really important film that you've made, and I'm sure. so pleased that you came. It's wonderful. Mm. Let's put it up. Thank you. It's the it's Spinney Hill, uh, the uh, the uh, African American history of Manhasset and Great Neck, and it's uh, uh, available. I mean, if you if you want to go to the website, it's Manhasset Great Neck one word dot com. And uh, I really think that you uh, that you miss it at your own peril. It's really awfully good. But how do you see the future? Because it's been it's been renovated. The housing project, where mm -hmm. I think most people yes. where most people lived, has been renovated, and it's just beautiful. Yes, it is very nice. And I, how has it changed? Has it made a change? in the kind of the sense of community and what is there. Well, we're welcoming new families to our community yeah. and uh, we're making new connections and, you know, and the, you know, it lives on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> now, is it essentially still uh, all African American? No, uh, we, we have uh, quite a few Hispanic families that have moved into uh, uh -huh. some of the apartments after the renovations were done. Uh, yeah, but they're just, they're our family too. Yeah. 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 And and the future. I mean, you dealt with the history. How do you see? Do you see? What do you see as the future? How how do you know? Well, I see if the taxes keep going up <laughs> around that area. I know. It's terrible. <laughs> no, I very often ask the question like, if your best wish were to come true about the community, mm -hmm. what, I, what would that be? I like more money towards the center. We need to get the center back having programs for the young kids. Yeah. We had we was fortunate enough to grow up where there was always something for us to do. Yeah. These kids don't have that anymore. Yeah. We had a place to go after school, had a place in the summertime to go. Yeah. And these adults who shaped us to be the men we are today, yeah. that need to be passed on to the next generation. Yeah. And the center is a great location and it's able to help people if they had the funding, which unfortunately it looks like they don't they're not getting enough funding. Yeah. Yeah. Not like they did in the past. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other other things. There's the computer. There's all that other stuff yeah. that's going on that didn't. But there's nothing like having that yeah. community center. Listen, I want to thank you both so much. Thank you for having us. It was Thanks. really terrific. And I, I tell you, you miss this film at your own peril. Mm -hmm. It is available at the Great Neck Library if you want to pick it up. But I think you should get the film and show it because it's a piece of American history. Absolutely. It's Manhasset and Great Neck and the USA. Mm -hmm. I'm Shirley Romaine for Art Scene. See you next time. We love Great Neck in Manhasset. We've seen a lot of changes over the years. We've seen a lot of buildings being torn down. I remember there was quite a few businesses. There were barber shops. There were stores that were black owned. There was um, Hotel James, which was owned by Tommy James. There were properties that all up and down Northern Boulevard, on the left and the right, that were black owned. So I often say that those people were role models 